From rappers turned gang members betrayed by their own crews to gang leaders attacked within their first 24 hours behind bars, the harsh reality of life in prison is a nightmare few can imagine. In this video, we'll uncover the brutal truth about what gang leaders endure once they're locked up. Vincent Gigant Before his infamous rise in the Mafia, Vincent Chin Gigani pursued a career as a professional boxer. Between 1944 and 1947, he fought 25 matches, winning 21 and making a name for himself as a light heavyweight contender. However, when his boxing career ended, Gigante found himself drawn into the world of organized crime. As a teenager, he became the protege of Vito Genovese, a key figure in the Luciano crime family, which later became the Genovese crime family. Gigante's reputation as a reliable and ruthless enforcer grew quickly. In 1957, Genovese ordered him to assassinate Frank Costello, the boss of the Luciano family. On May 2nd, Gigante ambushed Costello outside his apartment, wounding him. Though Costello survived, the attack convinced him to step down, clearing the way for Genovese to seize power. As his criminal career advanced, Gigante adopted a unique strategy to avoid law enforcement scrutiny. In the 1960s, he began wandering the streets of Greenwich Village in a bathrobe and slippers, mumbling incoherently, a ploy later dubbed the bathrobe defense. This calculated act made it appear as though he was mentally unfit, frustrating investigators and shielding him from prosecution. Gigante's influence grew steadily. In 1981, he became the boss of the Genovese family following Philip Benny Squint Lombardo's retirement due to health issues. To maintain a low profile, Gigante appointed Anthony Fat Tony Salerno as the family's front boss. Under Gigante's leadership, the Genovese family expanded its operations, including bookmaking and loan sharking, solidifying their dominance in the mafia world. Known for his cunning and ruthlessness, Gigante didn't hesitate to eliminate rivals. In 1987, Salerno and top members of other New York families were sentenced to 100 years in prison during the Mafia Commission trial. Initially, Salerno was believed to be the Genovese boss. However, after the trial, an informant revealed that Salerno was merely a decoy, with Gigante pulling the strings behind the scenes. Gigante's secretive nature made him almost untouchable. He avoided phones, spoke in whispers, and even whistled into receivers to evade wiretaps. His home was rarely left unoccupied to prevent FBI agents from planting bugs. Within the family, members referred to him only through gestures, pointing to their chins or forming the letter C with their fingers. Despite his meticulous precautions, the law eventually caught up with Gigante. In 1990, he was indicted on federal racketeering charges. Years of legal battles over his mental state followed. But in 1997, Gigante was convicted and sentenced to 12 years in prison along with a $1.25 million fine. Even behind bars, he continued to run the Genovese family, passing orders through his son Andrew. In 2002, Gigante faced new charges of racketeering and obstruction of justice. Confronted with undeniable evidence, he pleaded guilty and received an additional three-year sentence. On December 19, 2005, Vincent Gigante died at the United States Medical Center for Federal Prisoners in Springfield, Missouri, marking the end of an era for the Genovese family. His funeral, held quietly at St. Anthony of Padua Church in Greenwich Village, reflected his life, shrouded in secrecy and power. John Gotti. John Gotti's journey into a life of crime began at a young age. By the age of 12, he was already a member of the Fulton Rockaway Boys, a street gang with connections to the Mafia. It was here that Gotti began to learn the ropes of the criminal underworld. Dropping out of high school, he fully embraced a life of crime, starting with petty thefts and street fights before moving on to more serious offenses. Though he tried working legitimate jobs, the lure of the underworld was too strong to resist. Gotti soon became involved in truck hijackings and illegal gambling, which quickly earned him a reputation within the Mafia. His rise in the Gambino crime family was accelerated by his mentor, Agnello Neil Della Croce, the family's underboss. Della Croce recognized Gotti's potential and took him under his wing. By the mid-1970s, Gotti had been promoted to acting capo of the Bergen crew, solidifying his position within the family. Gotti's criminal activities extended beyond small-time operations. He played a role in major crimes, including the infamous 1978 Lufthansa heist, in which millions of dollars were stolen from JFK Airport. As his influence grew, so did tensions within the Gambino family. By the mid-1980s, Gotti and others grew increasingly frustrated with the leadership of Paul Castellano, the family boss, 
whom they viewed as out of touch and overly cautious. Fearing for his own safety and dissatisfied with Castellano's leadership, Godi began conspiring with other capos to take him down. The opportunity to act came when Castellano was arrested and facing serious charges. On December 16, 1985, Gatti and his allies orchestrated the assassination of Castellano and his underboss, Thomas Bilodi, outside a Manhattan steakhouse. With Castellano out of the way, Gotti quickly took control of the Gambino family. As boss, Gotti was known for his extravagant lifestyle and charisma, earning him the nickname the Dapper Don for his expensive suits and the Teflon Don for his ability to avoid conviction. Despite law enforcement's relentless efforts to bring him down, Gotti seemed untouchable for years. However, the FBI eventually planted listening devices in his headquarters, the Ravenite Social Club, and began collecting evidence against him. On December 11, 1990, Gotti was arrested alongside his underboss, Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano and Consigliere Frank Locascio. The charges included racketeering, murder, tax evasion, and bribery. Facing his own legal troubles, Gravano turned informant, testifying against Gotti in exchange for a reduced sentence. On April 2, 1992, Gotti was convicted of multiple charges including five murders and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Gotti's time in prison was harsh. Isolated under strict security, he struggled with the mental and physical toll of confinement. Despite his attempts to maintain control of the Gambino family from behind bars, his influence began to wane. In 1998, he was diagnosed with throat cancer. Though surgery initially removed the tumor, the cancer returned aggressively within two years. On June 10, 2002, at the age of 61, John Gotti died in prison. His death marked the end of an era for the Gambino family and the Mafia as a whole, signaling a shift in how organized crime operated. Some speculated that his decline was orchestrated to pave the way for new leadership, but his death ultimately underscored the fading power of a once dominant figure in the criminal world, Michael Torres. Michael Torres, known on the streets as Mosca, Spanish for fly, carved his path in the criminal underworld on the tough streets of San Fernando. Born into a life of hardship and crime, Torres quickly rose to prominence within the San Fer gang, his cunning and ambition catching the eye of Luis Suero Buff Flores, one of the founding members of the Mexican Mafia. In 1994, while serving time at Pelican Bay State Prison, Torres was sponsored for membership into the Mexican Mafia by Flores, marking the beginning of his rise within the notorious organization. After serving a 16-year sentence for manslaughter, Torres was released in the early 2000s. But freedom didn't lead to reform. Instead, he became the Mexican Mafia's tax collector for the San Fernando Valley. Torres controlled the region's drug and extortion rackets with ruthless efficiency, demanding a cut from every illegal transaction. Witnesses described his power. Mosca has a lot of juice. He runs the whole valley. Every neighborhood pays him. Torres's dominance wasn't confined to the streets. On June 12, 2003, his criminal career took a violent turn. That night, he knocked on the door of an apartment in North Hills, seeking David Diablo Mendoza, who had been falsely claiming to be a member of the Mexican Mafia, while extorting drug dealers and prostitutes. When Mendoza appeared, Torres asked if he was a carnal, a term for a true Mafia member. As Mendoza lifted his shirt to show his tattoos, Torres shot him in the chest. Later that night, Torres's crew turned on Smokey, a gang member who had informed Torres about Mendoza. Smokey was beaten, strangled with a rope, and stabbed with a screwdriver. Against all odds, he escaped. When Torres was arrested, a search of his mother's San Fernando home revealed bundles of cash stashed in a crawl space and $6,000 hidden inside a coffee pot. Despite having only a fifth grade education, Torres acted as his own lawyer during his trial. Witnesses reported that he prolonged his stay in men's central jail to maintain control over the drug trade, continuing to collect taxes from behind bars. Smokey, in custody for unrelated charges, received a chilling message during a visitor's attempt to intimidate him into silence. In court, Mendoza testified that it was Smokey, not Torres, who had shot him. But a year later, Mendoza was gunned down in North Hills, leaving his true story buried with him. Torres was convicted of attempted murder, witness intimidation, and other charges. He received a life sentence, but even in prison, his power only grew. Torres took control of the Mexican Mafia's rackets in the Los Angeles County jail system, overseeing extortion and drug sales with an iron grip. His lieutenants funneled $12,000 a week to him from jail profits. Outside, his influence extended across the San Fernando and Antelope Valleys, where gangs and dealers continued to pay his taxes. 
However, the throne Torah's built came with many enemies. On the morning of July 6, 2023, his reign ended violently. Around 9 a.m., he was attacked by Ray Cisco Martinez and Juan Angel Martinez, both serving life sentences for murder. In a brutal assault, Torres was stabbed multiple times. The prison, once his fortress, became his tomb. The motive behind the attack remains unclear, but Torres' climb to power left behind a trail of rivals eager to see his fall. Mosca's death marked the end of his brutal dominance, leaving a legacy of fear and power that continues to ripple through the criminal underworld.